Um, the theme of my remarks is going to be about change. Uh, some of you at IFPRI may be wondering why is Jerry Nelson up here? He talks about climate change all the time. What does he know about agribusiness, right? And the real reason I'm up here is that before my hair changed its color to its current gray and when it was brown, and I was at the University of Illinois, I had a, a very early days at the University of Illinois, I had a graduate student who's got a little bit less hair than he did at that time, but still he's got a lot more hair than I do, and certainly the color hasn't changed very much. So Kanda Jungkeller was a graduate student in one of my first courses at the University of Illinois, and we like to think that we had some influence on his success, but I think it had a lot more to do with Kanda than the University of Illinois. Anyway, three kinds of changes I want to say a few words about. Let me preface these by saying that the, the report itself is deep and rich and has lots of insights, which I'm not going to try in any way to, to repeat. And, and many of the things that I'll say today are actually covered in the report. I just want to pull out a few elements of them. So the three changes, climate change, institutional change, and infrastructure change. The report talks about the uh, importance of thinking about climate change in the context of what agribusinesses can do and, and will have to deal with going forward. And I just want to stress that point. Um, there are many things that we can't say about climate change. We can't say, for example, that East Africa will have more precipitation or less precipitation. The climate models are simply not good enough to let us know that. But what we can say is the temperatures will be going up everywhere in the world, and that includes in Africa as well. And so as businesses, as agribusinesses go forward, they need to be thinking about the consequences of climate change for agricultural productivity directly. Anybody who's left a house plant in a hot house knows that if it gets too hot, you don't have a plant when you come back. Um, and Africa is potentially headed for a situation in which many of the plants that we rely on for food um, are going to face that potential threat. Um, but so firms need to be thinking about that, but they also need to be thinking about the opportunities that can come from are so far aborted attempts to deal with climate change and the mitigation side of things. I think inevitably we'll end up with a carbon market. That isn't going to happen in the next couple of years, but I think we'll have to end up with a carbon market. Now, Africa is in some ways uniquely placed to deal with the carbon market, to take advantage of the carbon market, African agriculture, and agribusiness will play an important facilitating role between the international buyers of carbon credit and the African suppliers of carbon. Um, the second change that I want to talk about is institutional change. We, the, the phrase land grabbing was thrown up, and I want to talk very briefly about the whole role of, of land rights, property rights, and the fact that those are poorly developed in Africa. Perhaps, uh, I don't know if this is a prize that you want to uh, win, and I'm not sure that I can award it for Africa necessarily, but perhaps the worst land markets, property rights assignments are, exist in, in that, that very large area of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and that that needs to change. And there have been limited attempts to change it, and I think more attempts need to be made uh, to change it. And that's true both from the perspective of assigning uh, ownership of wealth, from which then you know people can draw their living in the future, but also to deal with this coming change. As people, you know, how can you keep them down on the farm, right? Nobody wants to live on the farm if they can go live in Nairobi. Um, and we're going to see this migration of people out of the countryside and into the cities in the next 50 years that will inevitably require changes in the agricultural sector. Those changes will be made much, will be facilitated uh, substantially if we can do a much better job with the, the land markets and do a f uh, an equitable distribution of land rights. In some sense, just assigning legal rights to the people who have for long had it. Um, but in other cases, there are places where the structure of rights will actually have to change, and I think, and that needs to be done. Um, um, so that's one kind of institutional change. The another kind of institutional change that needs to take place has to do with the educational system. We, Africa, is severely underinvested in its educational institutions, um, and those range from, you know, primary education to, to advanced postgraduate degrees. And I think that needs to happen in order to develop the human capital that was mentioned in a couple of different presentations to, to generate the wealth that, that is there and needs to simply be exploited. Um, but that uh, brings me to a sort of a, a little bit of sidestep away from this issue of changes and thinking about 
where these changes should take place. So uh, Africa has a billion people, but so does India. And India is a lot smaller than Sub-Saharan Africa, right? So population densities are substantially lower in Africa than they are in other places. And the question is, then is, to what extent should countries focus on doing these things themselves, or should they do them regionally? That has to do with regional in, uh, institutions. And so does it make sense, for example, to talk about regional universities? I'm not sure that it does, but at least it's something to think about. The Gates Foundation is funding a regional master's degree in agricultural economics, where several institutions on East Africa are collaborating to produce a master's degree. Regional um, um, markets, which, brings, which needs a different kind of institution. And then to bring me to my third point about change, it's infrastructure change, regional infrastructure. If you look at the, okay, so I'm kind of a infrastructure uh, advocate. I think I have made that clear on several points. And the rural roads in Africa suck, to use a technical term. <laughs> um, there are not nearly enough of them. They're really badly built, and they run the wrong ways, right? They run to the coast instead of, well, and that's not necessarily bad, but they also, the, the transportation infrastructure needs to move within the continent as well as to the, to the coastal regions. Uh, so the, the question is, can this actually happen, this regional integration of various kinds, institution, infrastructure, and markets? And, and I think if you look around the world, the answer is, well, maybe or maybe not. You know, if you think about Europe, how much trouble has it been to put together regional integration in Europe? And you might argue that it's going the wrong way at the moment as opposed to the right way. You know, and if you think about regional infrastructure, t just take the United States as a, as a set of very large regions, right? And so recently the U.S. Has, it looks to be coming back to the infrastructure as a, um, is, is important to do, but for a long time we disinvested in that infrastructure. And regional markets are easy to do when everything is going well, but as the recent crises with respect to the, like the heat wave and, and the droughts in, in, um, in Russia and then the floods in, in uh, Australia have indicated, it's a lot harder to maintain regional markets and, and regional integration when times get tough as opposed to when times are good. So, so I think, I think I think everybody in the room would say, you know, generally regional integration of various kinds is a good thing. How to make it happen and how to make it resilient to the changes that I think are going to be facing us is a really tough uh, set of challenges for somebody. And I don't think it's going to be me. Thanks.